gonna take Cracker Jack timing, Wang. Total concentration. You ready, Jack? I was born ready. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. It's time to do another career retrospective. This time we're going to someone a little bit more contemporary. Certainly, if you, you think it feels like Todd McFarlane probably hasn't been in comic books for like 35 years now, but I guess he has. So he's he's still got a legacy to complete, but he's there's been so much that's happened during his career um, that I thought it would be a good time to talk about him here. Obviously, with us is comic book award winning comic book editor and, and writer Joe Corral. How you doing, Joe? I'm all right, Wes. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. We've also got the voice of the voiceless, the man so cool they call him the Breen, the comic book hoarder, Eric Breen. How you doing? That never doesn't make me chuckle. I'm doing all right. Uh, the, the people love you. Whenever you're on the channel, they, they want more Breen. And I, I, I don't I don't disagree with them, but I can't have you showing me up too much. You know what I mean? No one says that. <laughs> <laughs> So I think one of the coolest things about the Todd McFarlane story is is like perseverance and then obviously eventually understanding his own worth and, and really kind of tracking his own career and taking his his own, um, you know, destiny in his hands. I always uh, really appreciate and respect that about him. Of course, the perseverance starts where he famously sends like 30 to 40 submission packages monthly to comic book editors, totaling over 700 submissions in a year and a half time. And he really doesn't get a lot of feedback here, Joey. He, he, you know, half results, he, I guess he got no response. The other half, you know, he either got a rejection letter and he did receive some criticism time to time from editors. But, you know, there was a lot of, he, he was given plenty of reasons to stop, but he just wouldn't. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, and, and that was um, the case for a lot of the image guys, the guys who would later move on there, you know, Rob Liefeld uh, and, and Jim Lee in particular both had somewhat similar uh, stories. But yeah, Todd really uh, stuck it in there, um, got some jobs. He ended up doing a little bit of, of stuff with DC, mm -hmm. uh, you know, do, working on that like Batman Year Two storyline. But uh, it, it didn't get that same traction. It really wouldn't be until he was uh, doing some Marvel stuff that his name really started to to blow up yeah because one of the few people that actually gives him feedback ends up being dc comics editor uh sal amandola who sent uh, mcfarlane a dummy script because what mcfarlane was doing with the submissions he was sending pinups mm -hmm. and he sent him the, this dummy script and he's like listen uh, i want to see if you can actually do storytelling you know what do your layouts look like you know can you tell a, a sequential story you know uh, as far as multiple pages yeah. And since uh, he, he did that, he advised McFarlane after that to focus on traditional comic storytelling in the submissions, do page by page work, show people that you can actually tell a story. So what he ends up doing, Breen, which kind of opens the door for him, is he creates a five page coyote sample script that he sends to Anne Nascenti, who passes it along to Archie Goodwin and Joe Duffy at Marvel's Epic Comic Imprint, which were doing the coyote story at the time, and Steve Englehart, who we just talked about, or maybe we're about to talk about. When we go into uh, into um, our Green Lantern story that we're doing this week, ends up calling Todd and offering him a job on Coyote, which ends up opening the door where he gets that work on uh, when DC and Marvel from 1985 to 87, does some Batman work, Batman Year Two being one of them, and then he finally gets land of his big break at Marvel on Hulk with Peter David. Yeah, yeah there was also you left out the first continuing job he got for one of the big two was on infinity inc at yeah. dc mm -hmm. and you i think he was inked on a lot of those by tony de you think so i'm sure i'm not pronouncing correctly but it, and and he if you read a story that was inked by tony de Zanega, you knew who the anchor was he was one of those guys that no matter who he inked you knew it was him but you could look past that and see that there was something there with him. And then, as you said, you know, the, the Batman year two, which I can't remember if he did all four issues. Yes, maybe. He did. He, okay. Yeah, cause he, he did three issues of detective comics and then he did the four issue Batman year two. Okay. Cause I think he ended up replacing Alan Davis who had to beg off of it or something that, but um, yeah. And, and you definitely, it, you know, and that was another example. This guy's got some chops. But for me, what really made me notice him, and again, I was there, I was there the whole time, 
<laughs> that was when he got to Hulk. And there was the one issue in particular that if you ask somebody that's seen all of his stuff, the go-to answer, obviously, is Spider-Man 300. Mm. Next is going to be Hulk 340. Mm. Because, you know, the, the fight with Wolverine. It's yeah. just, I mean, it's it's highly sought after. You know, everybody that has read it, you know, lo- you loved it once it. And I said, it's, uh, and that, that you, you could tell this guy had an incredible future ahead of him. It's crazy, Breen, because he doesn't have that house style that you would have uh, needed for DC and Marvel at the time. He's kind of breaking some rules here. He's uh, got a different bit of an art style, very kinetic energy flowing to it, which is what customers apparently wanted. We find that out. But, you know, to, to get a break in there and finally show off his goods, and he certainly uh, is immediately noticed on Hulk. But, yeah. you know, once he gets into ASM, Joe, working with David Michelini, I believe it's on ASM 298 is his first issue. Yeah. And he just blows up, blows up. It's that that wonderful style. He's He draws Spider-Man in the coolest poses you could ever imagine. But he's so intricate with his costume. Everything just looks cool. And it just immediately draws the eyes in. And he becomes pretty much a superstar. Yeah. And um, it's, it's interesting, though, because... Um, it, 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 we all know that Peter David and Tom McFarlane would later have their uh, have their debate uh, <laughs> about uh, comics, uh, but at the time uh, Peter David was getting Hulk, he was still considered, you know, like not not a big name or anything like that. He was really just getting his feet wet in terms of a writer. Uh, prior to this, he worked for Marvel, uh, but he was in sales. He was the guy who would like go to the shops and be like, "I we better not see you selling this before street date." That was some of the early work he had done for Marvel, and then he started doing some more of the writing. And he considered himself, you know, this like young upstart. And when they had suggested Todd McFarlane, uh, Peter David was in a position where he could have said no. And he wasn't particularly a fan of Todd's style at the time. But Peter David looked at it as, I'm just starting up. If I was in his shoes... I'd hate for someone to not give me a shot. I'm, I'm going to give this guy a chance. So there's a slight chance there's a, a parallel universe where Peter David said no, and then Todd got shuffled around and might have never been in the position to get Amazing Spider-Man. So it's it's really interesting how all these pieces sort of fit. Absolutely. Obviously, the, the big issue when people think about Amazing Spider-Man is Amazing Spider-Man 300, Venom, which uh, obviously yeah. Todd had a big, a lot to do with at least the, the look and feel of the character, you know, along with David Michelini, that iconic cover, yep. you know, millions of copies sold and all that good stuff. And he just ends up taking off. And this is a really cool uh, time in, in uh, Marvel where you're starting to see some of these new artists that are kind of breaking some rules, aren't traditional. You're, you're seeing, uh, you know, maybe a Jim Lee is going to arrive on X-Men pretty soon. Rob Liefeld with some of the X-Men related titles. Eric Larson, of course, is going to follow up Todd McFarlane on Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, yep. you know, these these really groundbreaking artists that are really going to change the game as we're kind of getting into that 90s bubble. Yeah, and um, <laughs> you know, and I like Larson on, on Spider-Man as well. But, um, but yeah, Todd changed the game there. It's very interesting because uh, Jim Salkrip's talked about this before, but Jim was almost taken aback at first because when he met Todd, you know, he's described it as he's not the Todd you you all know at this time. He was still a young guy. He was very soft-spoken. He came off a bit shy as, you know, he was being taken around the offices and introduced to different editors. It might have been Archie Goodwin who was taking him around. I'd, I'd have to uh, think back on that. But, you know, going in, being like, hey, here's this guy, Todd. He's got this portfolio. See if you could use it for anything. And prior to meeting Todd, Jim had a whole thing where he was already putting into motion getting rid of the black costume. Jim Salakrup hated the black costume, and he thought the best way to get rid of this costume would be make make it a villain so we can't redeem it. You know, it's like, look, that's going to be a villain's costume. Because he felt like this black costume looks like a villain's costume. Why is our hero and this guy who should be, 
attractive to, you know, kids and adults alike be dressed like a villain. And, you know, when you think about it that way, it does make sense. And he had talked with Tom DeFalco, or, or at the time it was Jim Shooter. And Jim Shooter wasn't thrilled with it. He wanted him to have the black costume a little longer, but gave Jim the go-ahead to set into motion getting rid of that. And he, so he knew they were going back to the original costume after issue 300. So Todd is in his office and again, like sheepish, sheepish, shy, short sort of guy, except the one thing he does is he perks up a bit and says, I'm o- I would only do Spider-Man if we got to get the, the old costume back. I, I want the, you know, red and blue. And, and Jim was like taken aback a little bit. Cause he's like, this is like this, like young upstart, you know, he's, he's still breaking in and he's telling me that the only way he'll do Spider-Man is if he'll go back to the old costume. But Jim knew they were going back to that costume. Todd didn't at the time. So the way Jim goes, he's, he's like, well, all right, we can we can bring back the costume for you if just for you. We'll we'll, we'll make it happen. We'll we'll I'll pull some strings and we'll do what we can and we'll we'll bring it back. So so that's how that all sort of starts. And then this is also where the who created Venom and all that stuff. It is very complicated. I know you you recently discussed David McElhenney had talked about that and like. Every part of it, like, again, this Venom wouldn't exist at all if Jim Salakrup wasn't determined to get rid of the black costume and to make the black costume a villain. That was his the sort of edict going going forward. We got to do this with this, this character. And then based on that, David then wrote this character. Um, and, and that was David's idea. They... David, I think, originally wanted to make the character uh, give it to a woman. And Tom DeFalco at the time was like, that's no, if if we're going to do this, it should be this character who's like hulking and much larger than than Peter. We want this to be a threatening character and all of that. So so you can even say to an extent that (laughs) Tom also had a big, you know, uh, stake in this, because if it wasn't for Tom saying that, David would have made, uh, you know, uh, Venom, a character who wasn't Eddie Brock. So so it is a very sort of complicated web, if, if you will. <laughs> but, but yeah, uh, then Todd went on in the way that him and David worked on that title. Uh, they were able to create a few other new villains that, none of us remember and also went on and uh had like a a best of sort of rogues gallery brought a lot of those old villains back and had some especially early on some very well-timed returns of venom and and yeah and it was a phenomenon i mean i i was a kid at the time but i knew venom and you know people you had your t-shirts and your action figures and your pajamas and, and all that stuff. Like it was a, a real big hit. Absolutely. He takes off to superstar. I and mean, this is really where you, you start seeing uh, the, the maturation of, of uh, Todd McFarlane and wanting to take his career in his own hands. Cause at the time uh, he starts getting dissatisfied with not really having creative control over what he's working on. And yeah. he starts uh, having some issues in there. It misses a few deadlines, have to bring in some filler artists, to, to illustrate a few issues in there. And he eventually ends up for, informing Jim Salakrup that he's leaving ASM at 328. And then I guess to appease him, they end up giving him adjectless, adjectiveless Spider-Man in 1990, which in itself, I mean, issue number one, 2.5 million comics sold. Yeah. No, and, and Jim Salakrup is also talked about it from a point of talking with Todd and being like, our goal is to outsell the X books. We want Spider-Man to sell higher than X-Men. And you got Sylvester, yeah. you got Jim Lee, you got Rob yeah. Liefeld over there. A lot of competition. Obviously on Spider-Man, you got Todd and you got, you got Eric Larson. 
Yeah, and they did manage to do it at points. Um, Jim's idea was in five years, we can build this up enough where we can outsell um, you know, X-Men and, and those other titles. And I believe he ended up doing it with in like less than three. And, and you know, part of that was, again, the adjectiveless Spider-Man. But that was all because Todd really understood and, and was curious about the medium. You know, he would ask Marvel things like, how come, you know, we're, we're putting out this book, it's, you know, it's getting real good traction, people like it, but it's on this cheap paper. And I, you know, you put out these other books and, you, you know, they look great and stuff. And it's like, this is like art. And don't we want to, you know, do something different? And, uh, you know, Jim ended up talking to, I believe it was Carol Kalish. And was trying to figure out what they could do with that. And, you know, Carol was like, oh, well, you know, there's really nothing we can do with Amazing Spider-Man. It's, it's too too much of a big mainstream kind of seller and stuff, you, you know, like that kind of stuff is more of a novelty thing at this point still. So we, we can't do that. But she was like, if you want, if you did another Spider-Man title, then we could do that. But we can't on Amazing Spider-Man. So that's how he ended up getting that Spider-Man adjective list to, to, to work on. And, and that's that all led to that and those those big sales that followed. So what's interesting on this brain, I've actually read uh, a pretty good portion of the Todd McFarlane Spider-Man comic. It's beautiful, very well illustrated. I'm not the biggest fan of the writing. I, I, I don't think he had become the writer that he would become eventually. I think he's a pretty proficient writer at this point. But you could see some issues that he had as, as far as just as a writer in, with storytelling, in my opinion. Yeah, a couple things. Um, getting back to his art for a second, the when you think of his, his Spider-Man, to me there are three artists that kind of define. Like you can point to and say, these guys have really separated themselves from everybody else that's ever drawn him. Obviously, Ditko mm -hmm. with with the poses, Gil Kane, mm -hmm. who we've talked about, and Todd McFarlane. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, and not to slight John Romita senior or junior or all the other artists that have worked on the book, but those three just had just unique, you know, poses and panel layouts for the character that I don't think anybody else has quite matched. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as your, you know, critique of the adjectiveless Spider-Man, you are absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. As a, as a comic book, it's visually stunning and that's where it ends. Um, but, you know, Todd Mc... Because there's no metric by which you can say that his book was better than his collaborations with Michelini. Mm -hmm. Yet, it outsold it. Because by that time, people... He was were, the brand. People yeah. were buying it because it was Todd McFarlane. They did... those. The vast majority of those fans didn't give two bleeps about David Michelini. Yeah. Because it was... I, I don't want to. I don't want to to say that it was the beginning of the style over substance era. This was the beginning of it, which was later, as we're about to talk about, put on steroids with the formation of image. Yeah. That's not a slight. I mean, it just that's just the way it was in those days. You didn't need the substance if you had the style. In fact, it might hurt sales because people were looking for a certain thing in those days. And this absolutely fed that beast. Absolutely. I mean, I think the first story arc, it's Spider-Man Wolverine, right, Joe? Or is that the... It's it's like, it, it was the 9 through 12, I think. Was okay. Yeah, the it. first it arc Wolverine. in Spider-Man was with uh, Wizard. Yes, okay. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, but yeah, and I, and I feel the, the same way. The stuff he did with David was uh, far superior to the stuff he wrote himself. But, you know, it's also very clear that Todd was heavily influenced by people like Frank Miller and, and John Byrne, who were, you know, writer artists. And, you know, while I, I don't think uh, Todd has, you know, hit those same levels in terms of his um, writing and art combined, 
uh, I think he has at, at points uh, as an artist uh, uh, certainly hit a, a lot of what they're able to do. But you see a lot of like um, like Frank Miller does those like really tall panels mm -hmm. sometimes. And, and you see that a lot in like Todd's work as well, especially because earlier Marvel stuff, you see a lot of, of, of Frank in, in, in that art. And, and I don't mean that as in he's copying. I mean that as in like, you know, clear like inspiration and, and does his own thing with it. But, uh, but, but yeah, Todd really um, sort of leveraged the medium in a way that stood out even amongst uh, the other uh, people involved in the formation of Image. And one other thing real quick, something. this is how powerful Todd McFarlane had become in such a short amount of time. There were three other monthly Spider-Man titles going at that time. He, those three kept a tight continuity. McFarlane did not have to. He was basically said, you've got carte blanche. Do what you want. Doesn't matter. You know, he kept, you know, obviously Peter and Mary Jane were, were married in this. But as far as like what was going on in the other books was not really a, a concern of his. So he just went off and did his own thing. Speaking of going off and doing his own thing, you guys have mentioned image. Obviously, that's the really the next step of his career. And like I said, he he's uh, he knows his worth, he knows his value, and he decided that that uh, Marvel wasn't valuing him as much as they they should. It was time for them to to branch off and create their own brand. Obviously, you had uh, you know Rob Liefeld, you you've got Jim Lee, Todd McFarlane, and others. They go off to the Image Seven, which was an enormous blow to Marvel. You end up losing pretty much your X Men office and most of your Spider Man office as far as your big draws with Eric Larson and whatnot, and they go move over. Uh, it appears, you know, in hindsight, at least initially, they were a bit naive on the amount of uh, of behind the scenes work that went in behind the publisher. That maybe it was more difficult to write and create and produce your own comic book and get it out for distribution than they thought. They were having a lot of issues uh, meeting deadlines and whatnot, just kind of from the get go. But from day one, you know, Spawn is essentially the the flagship title of of Image Comics, and. Uh, it looks fantastic, and Todd has definitely developed his own writing style on Spawn that you will see to this day. You still get the the three insets with the, with the different versions of media that are talking about the story that's going on. And you know, if that's your 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 deal, you're going to love the stories that Todd McFarlane is producing to this day on Spawn. And I think they're fantastic. But as great as an artist as as Todd McFarlane is, and it certainly helped out with the initial sales of Spawn, which is is still doing well to this day. He's a phenomenal. I do mean phenomenal uh, evaluator of talent. You're talking about mm -hmm. Greg Capullo, Tony Daniel, and others that he would all come in and illustrate Spawn because he is absolutely able to identify great art talent that will fit his character. Yeah, Greg Capullo as well. Um, yeah. You know, uh, was able to draw in a lot of big, heavy-hitting writers. Uh, you know, Dave Sim, Frank Miller. Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman, Alan Moore, Grant Morrison. Um, it's... I think the two people uh, from the the image revolution that uh, made it the biggest in sort of opposite ways were Jim Lee and, and Tom McFarlane. Jim uh, creating enough IP that people considered worth enough that you know DC kind of came in and absorbed it. And buy them so, out, yeah, yeah. So so that's something. But but Todd sort of elevated uh, beyond comics in a way that mm -hmm. no one else really has. I mean, just McFarlane toys alone, had he not had even been involved in comics is uh, a major feat. And the, the fact that, you know, growing up, I mean, I, I was the right age where, you know, I didn't even necessarily know the plot lines of the comics I would get the Spawn comics and the big action figures. I'd be, you know, kid being like, oh, that action figure looks cool. Let me buy it. Ooh, there's a comic and I got that. <clears throat> I, I played and beat the Super Nintendo Spawn game. You know, there, there was yeah, the all MTV sorts of, series that was on there for quite a few years. Yeah, no, there was all that sort of stuff that like really, um, you, you know, built up this brand in a way that uh, no one else, I, I think, was able to really like and, and even like put image aside just the fact mm -hmm. that this guy created this kind of ip uh as well as working on uh, characters like spider-man just puts them on this level that is 
almost entirely impossible to replicate. It was crazy, Breed. Th to this day, he's obviously he's still writing Spawn. He's created this new Spawn universe. We got the King Spawn. We got the Scorch. We got Gunslinger Spawn. He's, he's got all these uh, titles that are flowing out of it now. And it seems like it's going to be a big success. Todd McFarlane does not need to write comic books anymore. He could still be having Spawn created. He doesn't need to write that. He doesn't need any of that stuff anymore. He's got so much success outside of comics. But you know that he loves comic books because he's still here and he's still a part of it. The yeah, best way I can put it about Tom McFarlane is, yeah, you know, I myself, I have never been a Spawn fan. Mm. And I had, you know, I, I was in at the beginning and I can't remember when I finally dipped out. But I think if, to me, the most important comic book being published today is Spawn for one reason. As you said, he genuinely loves the medium. And in a day and age where so many creators actively try to either chase away fans or make them pass purity tests to read their stuff or whatever you want, whatever you want. he is a fan first artist. He, he, he's, he, you know, whether it's the two ninety nine price tag that he still has on the main title, the giving the fans what they want. I mean, you know, he's definitely tapped into the market of people that love Venom and Carnage, and that that's that whole segment of fandom. Kids is, love chains. That was his big thing, right? Spawn is 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 he gives the people what they want. It seems like such a simple thing, but he's but if I, not everybody does it, but he does because there were there was a long period of time where Spawn. Was I'm not gonna say all you know, forgotten, but it did. It, it dipped down to like eleven thousand issues. Yeah, it was. It was. I mean, the renaissance that it's had in the last few years is amazing in an industry that continuously finds ways to either self sabotage or to or if if they try to rebrand or you know, come back. I mean, it's it's a modern Lazarus story. Mm -hmm. What he's done with Spawn and. Yeah, and I, yeah, I said I, yeah, for me, I, I'm, I'm thrilled that yeah, there's somebody out there that genuinely cares about the the industry, the genre, its fan base, and I, I yeah, they said the success that he's gotten just from that because, as you said, with the toys, with everything else, you know, hell, he survived what might be the most bullshit lawsuit ever filed. Remember the hockey player. Tony Twistelli. Oh, because he, right. he's named a villain after yeah. him. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the guy is a, a a tremendous success, and you're right; he doesn't need any of this. But it's almost like he's he's at the point now where he's giving back, and yeah, you know, it's. I said I'm I'm really happy to see the Spawn you know, universe exploding again. Yeah, it's and on top of all that, again, it's over 300 issues. And, mm -hmm. and to, to further put a point on the fact that he loves this medium, there is more than enough IP available through Spawn now. He doesn't have to do any of this stuff. Nope. He can just worry about selling the rights to, you know. it all off. Yeah. And, but, but he's still involved and he's still doing more to keep telling the story. Uh, when he doesn't have to, there's plenty of stuff out there in Spawn alone. For him to be like, oh, you want to do a movie or a game or whatever? Here, this arc, or, or here, look at this stuff. So, so that really puts a point on it. And then, you know, speaking of lawsuits, he is one of the few people <laughs> who can get involved in a lawsuit with Neil Gaiman, lose that lawsuit, two or and, twice, and and everyone's like, cool, it's like that's fine, whatever. <laughs> like that's <laughs> that's impressive. He might have, he might have been a little shifty on that first uh, agreement that 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 first settlement with the uh, was it Miracle Man, yeah, where he I think he sold he, he traded in the logos he was supposed to be the full IP that's not exactly what, it, but hey it yeah. happened they they went through it twice and it got all settled. Marvel yeah, owns but, the character now anyway. But there's a lot of there's a lot of people like a lot of comic writers and artists out there who if they were in a similar situation. Uh, everyone would, you, there'd always be the whispers of like, oh, did you hear what this guy did? Like, what a jerk. But like, that doesn't like, 
he's got this like he's so he's the top father he, yeah, he's above that somehow. Even though he was in it, he still comes off as like above that, and it doesn't weigh on him in a way that it would with with other uh, people. And, and I think that speaks a lot to uh, his charisma and and uh, how people respect him. He certainly has a wonderful business acumen. Obviously, um, keeping the price point for Spawn at two ninety nine separates it essentially from the entire industry right now. There are very few other comics that do that. Certainly none with a with a kind of a more of a as far as indie scene goes, it's an A-list talent or mm-hmm. A-list character. Kept it at that price point, went over that three hundred issue threshold, broke the record of the longest uh, continuous independent comic, independently owned comic comic book published ever, passing Cerebus when it went to three hundred one. No plans to to finish off. He's only doing expanding and stuff like that. And uh, mm-hmm. it's. You know, people love him. It feels like uh, the people in the industry love him, and and he's he's still an executive to end, at Image Comics to this day. And Image obviously is a much different place today than it was when it first formed up. They eventually uh, kind of found their their footing, what they were going to be moving forward. It wasn't exactly going to be showcasing the most uh, mind bending, cutting edge art in the history of the world. It was kind of going more the vertigo model, telling different types of different flavors of story, whether they be, uh, you know, superheroes or, or uh, maybe horror kind of stuff like that. Uh, image has changed a lot, you know, through all of this. And Todd mcfarlane has been there the whole time. And uh, you just, you just got to respect him. You know, not my favorite writer in the history of the world, but man, that guy can, he's one of the best artists of all time. Yeah, a- a- absolutely. Uh, yeah. He, he could use uh, at least a plotter, but um, but yeah, he's uh, definitely. He brought in some uh, yeah. some writers there for a while, but you know, no, he sure did. He yeah, he, no. like, he likes it. Yeah, so go but, for it. but you know, it's um, on the one hand, I can say something like that. On the other hand, it's like you know, Todd, take advice from me. It's not like you you're a self made like multi millionaire or anything like that. <laughs> like, it's not like you were able to spend <laughs> two point five million dollars on a baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Like, you know, like, that's all well and good, Todd, but here's what you should really do is, you, know. you need to bring in a Joe Corallo. I'll plot it all out for you. <laughs> so it's absolutely it's such a cool story. The perseverance being turned down, you know, 700 times and then finally to get your break, make your way, become your own brand that's bigger than Marvel. Leave them in the back. Go create your own or be part of creating your own publisher line. Have the 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 flagship character, the flagship series to this day, you know, 30 years later, still going on. You know, create this wonderful toy line that has all these exclusive agreements. They just announced them at DC Fandom that they're doing the Batman black and white series. And people have say nothing but good things about Todd McFarlane toys nowadays. And it's it's insane where he started, you know, for a Canadian kid that loved comics and now. You know, he's, he's his own brand that, that absolutely transcends uh, comics. He's had movies, television shows, video games, and it looks like we're probably going to get another movie in the near future. So it's it's such a unique story, Brie, and you'll never have another Todd McFarlane. I would have to agree with that. Yeah. Imagine having previously worked at DC, quitting Marvel to start a new company, setting up a meeting with DC after quitting Marvel, showing up with the rest of the guys and being like, oh, by the way, we set this meeting up to tell you we're also not working for you. (laughs) To set up a meeting like that with DC to tell them specifically, I'm not working with you, and now he's got exclusive rights and licenses to make their toys and statues. Yeah, the most marketable that's, comic character in the world. <laughs> well, that's when I would bring up that you know Terry Bollea once testified against Vince McMahon, then went yeah. back to work for him. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, strange, but why not? No, absolutely. But it is one of those things. It's like it's it's very rare for people yeah. to be in positions where they can get away with that. And, and it's Tom McFarlane's shit. a rare guy. Yeah. You got to have the goods. Yeah. So you, you got to respect the man, respect the game, and uh, absolutely uh, love Todd McFarlane. One of the people that, to this day, when he says something, it, it goes out on every publication, at least within comic books, as, as a major headline, because everyone is interested in what he has to say. Uh, do you have any final words on Todd McFarlane, Eric? No, other than that, like I said, he's just one of those 
few people that you never hear anybody really say anything bad about. Yeah, you know, it's just, not even Neil Gaiman. I mean, if you I said whether I'm, I'm talking about like fandom in general. But I got you. Yeah, even yeah. if you're not a, a particularly a fan of his work, you're a fan of the man and mm -hmm. what he has done for the this hobby that we're all a part of. So, you know, I said, I yes, yeah, hope he keeps on for another 10, 20, 30 years. Why not? Yeah. And uh, I, I would just add anyone listening to this, check out on YouTube, uh, Todd McFarlane on the Home Shopping Network in 1992. A lot of people out there right now think this is brand new stuff. People streaming on YouTube and selling their comics and, and, and really pushing that kind of stuff. But Todd McFarlane was doing that in 1992 on TV back when you had to call the home shopping oh, yeah. network and be watching it as it was happening and uh, you know, order things uh, like comics and whatnot from Todd. It's, it, it's really interesting stuff. Absolutely. He was definitely a man uh, ahead of his time and he's still one of the, the leading figures in comic books. I do want to say thank you very much to Eric Braid and Joe Corallo for joining me today. Talking about Todd McFarland and we will see you all next week.